Okay, we have a, a lesson on differential equations, slope fields, and even Euler's method. So a lot of content in this uh, video. I believe it's going to be in at least two parts, perhaps three. But let's take a look at example one. A problem that we have solved here before in BC Calc, solving a differential equation. Uh, what you want to do for differential equations, of course, is to separate variables. Uh, and in fact, we've spoken about the importance on how the College Board really is looking for that very important first step. Uh, separating variables means get uh, anything with a Y on this left-hand side with a DY, anything with an X on that right-hand side. We're going to integrate the left side and the right side. The left side, I think, is pretty simple. You integrate a 1 with respect to Y, and you get... Uh, just a y. Uh, there is a constant, but we'll slide that constant over to the right-hand side as well. Uh, but on the right, what we have is the integral of sine of x times the cosine of x dx. Let's try u substitution. And uh, it might just be very, very helpful to let u, in this case, be sine of x. Because if that were the case, then du well, the derivative of sine would be the cosine of x. Uh, and you can see this right-hand side, cosine of x dx. We're going to see that right here as well. So what you can see rather quickly, the sine of x would become a u. Cosine of x dx is just a du. And if we were integrating uh, u with respect to uh, u, we'd get u squared divided by 2 plus a constant. Of course, uh, what we're going to do is plug that u uh, value of sine of x back in. We have the sine of x squared all over 2 plus c. We've dealt with this type of a problem before. Uh, again, one more comment about the constants. I mean, technically, you could say that there's a plus c, a plus c1 on the left side, a plus c2 on the right side. In all truth, though, those are just two constants. We could subtract the constant from the left side from the constant on the right and still get a constant. We'll just uh, simplify life and just put a plus C only on the right side. So uh, no big deal right here. Uh, you might notice, though, that I did say this would, was method one. Uh, there are other approaches we could have taken, of course, and uh, I'd like to show that right now. Uh, if we were to separate variables again and integrate, uh, sometimes this seems to be just the exact same startup. But for our u substitution, who's to say that we had to let u equal the sine of x? Couldn't we very well let u equal, say, the cosine of x? And we certainly could. Uh, du would be the opposite of sine of x dx. And at this point, if we were solving, we could say that the sine of x dx would equal a negative du. And uh, that would be something for us to think about a little bit here. Uh, it's going to change things up a little bit. You could say, well, of course, I'm going to let uh, cosine of x be a u. But our sine of x dx, well, that becomes a negative du. And uh, all of a sudden, we realize things are looking just a tiny bit different. I could pull that negative out in front. We didn't have a negative before. If I were to take an antiderivative of u, we'd get u squared all over 2 plus a constant. Uh, but also, our u now is representing cosine of x. So look at this. All of a sudden we're going to notice that our answer is the opposite of cosine squared x all over 2 plus c. Immediately we compare that to our method 1 answer, and perhaps we feel a little bit upset. Uh, understandably, you'd think, wait a minute, that's not the same uh, answer that we just came up with method 2. But wait, it actually is going to get even more interesting. Let's just say that we had dy is equal to the sine of x cosine of x. Uh, dx, and uh, very quickly again, we could say, well, let's go ahead and integrate. Well, let's just say that uh, we looked at the integrand and we thought for a moment, now wait a minute, 
This sure looks like 2 sine of x cosine of x. A very famous trig identity, by the way. Uh, if we put a 2 in there, we could counterbalance that by multiplying a 1 half out in front. And then we could have our integrand be represented as 2 sine of x cosine of x. So now this really does make life a little bit more interesting because the integral can be written more simply using that very famous double angle formula, double angle identity, uh, that the sine of 2x is equal to 2 sine of x cosine of x. Well, at this point, my goodness, the antiderivative of the sine of 2x uh, would be the negative of the cosine of 2x. Reversing the chain rule, we divide by 2 again. And uh, my goodness, all of a sudden, we would arrive at this. Double check that we're correct. Uh, take the derivative of cosine of 2x, we would get negative sine of 2x, so the negatives would cancel. But then by the chain rule, uh, the derivative of that inside part would bring out a 2. Remember what we said before in a previous chapter, uh, that uh, rather than doing a u substitution, which you may do here, uh, you could actually just reverse that chain rule. Rather than by multiplying by a 2x with an antiderivative, we divide uh, by a 2 here. Uh, so in any event, you could quickly see that this is in fact correct. But more to the point, I think what will trouble kids quite a bit is they'll see that we had three different methods and we arrived at what appears to be three different answers. And I think that immediately will upset kids quite a bit. Tell you what we could do though, take out a graphing calculator. And uh, of course the C is an arbitrary constant, but if we go ahead and if we were to type all three answer forms in, the sine of x squared all over 2, ignore a constant. Method 2 yielded the opposite of cosine squared of x all over 2. Our third answer was just negative 1 fourth, 0.25, cosine of 2x. Ignore those constants. If we graph this, say, on a uh, zoom decimal window, or even on a zoom trig window, you'll see, yes, most definitely all three curves are uh, graphed separately. However, if you look very closely, it's going to look like these curves are just vertical translations of one another. In other words, if I'd add uh, a, a certain constant to, say, our first graph, we'd be able to elevate it or drop it down to fit another one. And that's where this plus C turns out to be so very, very important. The plus C is an arbitrary constant. All three of these answer forms look so very different from each other, but with an appropriate choice of C, we could make any two of these be equivalent. And we've seen that in trig uh, identities when we would prove a left side equal to a right side. The left side might look drastically different. Uh, so I don't want any of us to be quite upset if, uh, you know, we check our work with one of our group members and uh, someone has a, a different looking form. Uh, it very well could be that both students are correct. Let's take a look at example two. Uh, let's separate variables once again. Uh, for a differential equation here, uh, multiply by dx, and if we're trying to find a particular solution here. We're trying to find out what y is so that the derivative of that uh, function, y, would be e to the x minus 6x squared. But even more so, we also have an initial condition. Uh, we have a 1 comma 0. Uh, we have a point that the graph must contain. Uh, so we could integrate both sides very quickly. Integrating, we'd get y on the left. Antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x itself. Uh, using the antiderivative reverse of the power rule here, bump up our power by one step, bump it up to x to the third, and then divide by that new power. And uh, very quickly we can... Uh, double check that we're correct. In fact, that's such a very good thing to do. Once you've taken an antiderivative, 
take the derivative very quickly just to make sure that you've done this correctly. Well, uh, we're not quite done. We need to look at the point 1 comma 0. That means x equals 1 when y is equal to 0. Substitute these values in. Let x equal 1. And uh, let's solve for our c value. Uh, you know, this of course, uh, 1 cubed, we just have e minus 2. And if we were solving for c, uh, we could see that the c would equal well, really 2 minus e. Add a 2 to both sides, subtract an e. And that will lead us further to y equals e to the x minus 2 x to the third. And then plus our c value of 2 minus e. Uh, remember, we had this answer in a general form. Uh, we're now moving to our particular form. Uh, we know that this equation solves our differential equation. And if we let x equal 1, y would equal 0. We have the point 1 comma 0 on our curve. Uh, for number 3, use an accumulation function to find a solution to f prime of x is equal to e to the opposite of x squared, for which f of 7 is equal to 3. Again, we're saying that we have the point 7, this is our x value, with a y value of 3. And uh, really to help us out, an accumulation function, f of x, is an integral function. And uh, we're going to put in a dummy variable. Uh, and in fact, what we've seen from the fundamental theorem of calculus is that the integrand is always uh, going to be this, uh, you know, derivative of f of x here, so that f of x would have an antiderivative. Uh, so we'll have e to the opposite of t squared uh, in our integrand. Uh, and, you know, if we took a derivative, of course, we're going to be able to arrive at uh, you know, our f of x function, our f prime of x equaling e to the opposite x squared. Uh, we'd like our upper bound to be x, but now we're going to beg the question, how on earth can we uh, come uh, to this point of f of 7 equaling 3, that when x is 7, y would equal 3? Uh, what is this lower bound down here? Well, here's something uh, really neat for you to see. Our lower bound is actually going to show up as our x-coordinate. And here's why. When we put in a 7 right in here, it's uh, hopefully a bit of review for us to realize that when we have an integral, let me make a little bit of a of scratch work over here. If I were integrating from 7 to 7, imagine that we had this. That, of course, would arrive at 0. So this is why our x value is going to be that lower bound, so that when we plug in a 7 for f of x, let x equal 7. Our upper bound is a 7 also. The integral from 7 to 7 is 0. Uh, but we don't want f of 7 to equal 0. We want it to equal 3. So we'd add a 3 after that. So the x value that we're going to have for our accumulation function on this point is going to show up in the lower bound. Uh, the y-coordinate we write uh, as plus that value outside of the integral. So that when I let x equal 7, the integral itself reduces to 0. And then we're left with just a 3. Uh, and that would, of course, cancel out to saying f of 7 equals 3. So this is how we represent an accumulation function. Slope fields. Slope fields. Well, a slope field, my goodness, what we have here is, uh, you know, a way to represent tangent line slopes on a little bit of a chart. Uh, we have a differential equation that dy dx is equal to the cosine of x. And we're going to have a window from negative 3 pi over 2 to positive 3 pi over 2. Uh, and our y value, it looks like we're going from negative 4 to positive 4. Uh, so, I'll tell you what, it looks like uh, maybe we'll have a 0 here, maybe pi over 2, pi, and 3 pi over 2. 
uh, going in a negative direction, we could have negative pi over 2 